Thank you, Dr. Muno. Next, we have Mace Vaughan. And just a note, could we please um, hold questions until the end of the presentations? Great. Thanks, Michelle. Pierre and I actually had a phone call about a week ago to coordinate, and we did exceptionally well. <laughs> I'm very pleased. All right. And does this do, Michelle? Oops, actually, I can, never mind. I can, I found out. Um, this is, fan I'm very excited to be here, very excited to be invited. And um, in my coordination with Pierre about sort of the science behind bees and uh, neonicotinoids, um, we sort of, did, we, we split things up. And so I get to drill those three, those two slides that Pierre had to whip through, I get to drill down deep on those. So what I'm going to do is kind of focus on what we know about the science on the impact of these products, specifically on bees, um, bees and pollinators. And just so, I wanted just to kind of introduce my program a little bit more, so a little more context on me. I manage right now, I think, what is the largest pollinator conservation program in the world. We've got the Xerces Society has 20 full-time staff, maybe 21, well actually 21 in a few weeks, who are working all across North America on identifying and tracking um, at-risk pollinators. I'll talk a little bit about declines in bumblebees um, that many people don't know about, but we work on all sorts of other endangered species, many of which are butterflies and, and bees. Um, we develop technical guides and trainings. We really help farmers all across the country and the agencies that work with those farmers create habitat, have the tools to create habitat, and then really work towards pesticide protection. And increasingly, we're doing restor um, habitat restoration and habitat policy work, trying to create an infrastructure to help fund, to help cost share, um, help pay farmers to create habitat for pollinators, but also other beneficial insects on and around their farms. And we've been doing this by collaborating with the USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service, one of the agencies within USDA that you know, for me, it has the greatest hope for actually helping to make change happen on the ground, and they've been an incredibly important and incredibly strong partner for us. And this team that we've brought together comes with backgrounds in farming, entomology, teaching, habitat restoration, wildlife conservation, um, native seed production. It's this incredibly diverse group of people spread all across the country who are able to support each other and the farm communities that we work with to put projects, to put habitat on the ground, and increasingly to work towards pesticide protection. Um, so I just wanted to give that background so you have a sense of sort of where I'm coming from. And I actually work in a joint position. I have four staff myself included, who work in, as joint sort of partner biologists with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And for those, how many people know the NRCS? Like what sort of, about half. So this is the agency that um, administers the conservation provisions of our farm bill. So the billions of dollars that get allocated for five year periods to go to do conservation work on the farm, this is the agency that works with those farmers. So today, uh, to follow up on Pierre's talk, I want to focus in on, really focus in on these pollinators and kind of talk about their importance and what we know about their decline very quickly, and then spend a little bit of time going over some of the details on the effects of neonics on these, on these bees um, and kind of sort of, uh, sort of play off of what Pierre wrapped his talk off with to kind of lay out, or what are some of the, what are, what's the direction that we want to go and where is the water murky and where is it clear? So just to put this in context, to help us understand bees, 85%, 85% of flowering plants need an insect to move pollen from flower to flower in, in order to set fruit or to set seed. Um, most, of, particularly in the temperate areas, these are primarily bees, which is why we focus on them in an agricultural environment because bees, honeybees obviously, but all these wild bees that are there as well, they're our workhorse. They're doing, the, they're doing this work for us. And if we drill down a little bit deeper, 35% of crop production worldwide is either completely or significantly dependent upon an insect, upon a bee usually, in order to set fruit. And if you look at the value of those crops in the US, that's 18 to $27 billion worth of production. Um, and if we look worldwide, we're looking at $217, $217 billion worth of production. Now this is just farm gate money. This is just what's getting paid to the farmer. This does not take into account what happens when those products get pulled into the market, get turned into other products, get sold up the chain. This is just what farmers are making. If we look at these products of pollination, they include fruits and vegetables. These are actually not to mention dairy and meat. If you look at the alfalfa chain, if alfalfa seed needs a pollinator, and then you, from that seed you grow alfalfa that gets fed to cows for dairy or milk. I'm sorry, dairy or meat. 
Um, so most of our vitamins, most of our minerals come from insect pollinator plants or are the result, you know, ultimately if you trace them down the supply chain, are pollinator dependent. And I think as Pierre said, one in three mouthfuls of the food and drink that we consume traces its way back. Now this doesn't, I took out my slide for brevity, but I got to talk about it anyway because it just plays off too well. 89% um, of birds, 89% of birds are dependent upon insects during at least, at least one life stage. If we create an environment that can support diverse and abundant insects, we're supporting close to 90% of our birds. 25% of birds and mammals feed on seeds or fruit that are the product of pollination. So wildlife, if we are supporting these insects in our agricultural environments, in our urban and suburban environments, these are critically important for our natural environments and beyond if you look at those food chains. So just to keep that in perspective as well. Now we touched a little bit upon what's going on with honeybees and what's going on with declines in bees generally. And so I wanted to hit on that as well, just to sort of set that stage. <clears throat> if you look to um, 1995, which is the first year I actually started as a beekeeper, um, that year beekeepers across the country took a huge hit. They went from losing five, maybe 10% of their bees a year to losing 15 to 22% of their bees a year. And that was because of the varroa mite, this tick this huge bee tick that was introduced into the United States in the late 80s and then in 1995 all of a sudden whoo, took off and it was a it was a hammer blow to the beekeeping industry and for the sick what would it be almost 10 years 11 years after that beekeepers were losing 15 to 22 percent of the bees and that was hard um, they can make it work they can make it work but that was hard 2006 we have the introduction of a new problem this colony collapse disorder this is an additional 10% losses all of a sudden being heaped onto the beekeeping community so that now, today, really I say beekeepers are losing about a third of their bees every year. If you're in Iowa, this year it's more like 65%. Um, if you're Ontario, uh, Canada, it's more like 48%. But in general, on average, beekeepers across the country are losing about a third of their bees every year. Now, I work for the Xerces Society. The focus of our work, the emphasis is on wild bees, wild animals, native bees in these environments. And so we spend a lot of time trying to understand what's going on with bumblebees, working with colleagues all across the country. Um, and we've got five species I'll highlight here that we've been tracking. Franklin's bumblebee, which lives just in southern Oregon, northern California. It's probably extinct as of the last few years. The western bumblebee, a wide-ranging bee, unlike the Franklins, this is a bee that was the most common bee actually here in Portland. Actually, I take that back. Would have been one of three most common bees in Portland, um, let's say 10, 15 years ago. If you went in your backyard in Portland um, in the late 90s, you would have seen either the California bumblebee, yellow-faced bumblebee, or this critter, the western bumblebee. Well, it's seen a 28% range loss, and you can't find it anywhere in the Willamette Valley right now. If you go to the eastern North America, the yellow-banded bumblebee, the rusty patch, have both seen huge rain lo range losses. The American bumblebee, if we look across the board, 30% of bumblebees right now are at risk or heading toward, like, at risk of extinction. They're threatened or heading towards extinction across the country. <clears throat> if we look at butterflies, now the monarch butterfly has been in the lose, news a lot this year. Um, 1990s, there were hundreds of millions of monarch butterflies that made this epic journey from the eastern plains, from southeastern Canada and the Maritimes, all the way down to the hills outside of Mexico City. Um, hundreds of millions would have been gathered on the trees there. This year, only 33 million butterflies made that trip, which actually might sound like a lot, but not when you look at the historic trends. So here's the, the area. This is the actual area covered by butterflies as tracked um, by colleagues at the World Wildlife Fund and others over the last 20 odd years. The average comes in at about six. This is six right here. In the last few years, we're down to a tenth of that. So this year, the forest has been protected as much as it can be. We have not seen in the last few years a reduction in the forest area, but we continue to see this decline in monarchs. And what's interesting about the monarch butterfly is I use it as an example of common butterflies. This is not a butterfly that's going to go extinct. This is not a butterfly that's unusual. Everybody, well, except unless you live in the Willamette Valley, most people in North America have monarchs as part of their landscape. Um, however, what we're seeing and what the, ex the butterfly experts that we work with all, the country, all across the country are seeing is that common species, 
are also in decline dramatically. Although we don't have good numbers to quantify this, we see this across the country. Jared Daniels pictured here, a colleague at the University of Florida. What should be most alarming to all of us is that this downward trend has now spilled over to include many previously more wide-ranging and common butterflies. And for me, this is the worry. It used to be conservation was focused on rare habitats, habitats that were a threat. Um, and where you could focus on that and protect that and try to try to protect that species. All of a sudden, we're seeing common species across broad landscapes dropping out. Now, there are many threats, many threats to pollinators, to bees, to these butterflies, um, habitat loss, diseases and pests, climate changes and pesticides. Um, and obviously, tonight, I'm going to be focusing on the pesticides. But I want to harken back to something Pierre um, mentioned in his talk. There are all sorts of synergies between these things. We've got beekeepers in the northern Great Plains. If they're able to put their bees in the summertime on an area of high quality habitat, those bees will survive by 90% 90, 90 of those bees will survive the next winter. If those bees are instead over summered on poor habitat where there's more, there's more agriculture, there's more pesticide exposure, harder for those bees to clean out, 40% of those bees survive the next year. So, I mean, this, there are all sorts of interactions like that. As Pierre mentioned, if you've got bees that are exposed to some of these neonicotinoid insecticides, they become more susceptible to disease. If you've got bees that are diseased, they are similarly more susceptible to the problems of insecticides. And so what's murky, what's difficult for me, is trying to unravel and untwist this knot. Um, and so therefore, our focus is on really trying to just cut the knot. We're going to treat it like the Gordian knot. We're just going to cut it in half um, and try to take on as many of these as we can. We focus on habitat and pesticides. And I think just I want to paint a picture of what we've seen with um, neonic use in the United States over the last 20 years, because I think it's compelling. And this is just for one product. This is just imidacloprid, a fantastic and very useful data set put out by the US Geologic Survey a few months ago um, that maps usage of these products year by year over time. And so we pulled out, this is 1994. This is the use of imidacloprid in the United States soon after it was approved. If you jump ahead to 1999, it spread a, spread a little bit. Um, you jump ahead to 2004, all of a sudden it's across the Great Plains as we've introduced mostly seed treatments that are being used on hundreds of millions of acres. And we take it to 2009, and you can see potentially why Iowa might have a 65% honeybee loss for bees that reside in that state. So as Pierre mentioned, over 200, I mean, if you look at corn and soybean alone, that's 168 million acres of seed treated crop. Um, and that is phenomenal in my mind. Um, but it's only phenomenal when you understand what that means. So I mean, we apply pesticides to crops all over the country. Um, if we were to look at many other, any other pesticides, we'd see similar trends over time, I'm sure, as they come and go and as their usage happens. But I think what's important here and critical for us to understand is, you know, what is, what is, what's a meaningful, like, what does this mean? Like, what are the effects of these, of these pesticides when they're applied on these different landscapes? So we've done, Xerces pulled, wrote out a report. I've got a couple copies here. I'll have more copies tomorrow mor morning summarizing this literature on what's going on. Like, what, what's the data is available on the effects of neonics on bees? And so what I want to do is sort of roll out for you, kind of highlight what do we know about the toxicity of these products for different bees, and then what do we know about the exposure because really that's what it comes down to. We need to understand how toxic is it and then what are bees finding, what happens when they contact this in the field. So there's a tremendous diversity of bees out there. Um, and the honeybee is where we've obviously got the most research and the most data. But there are 50 species of bumblebees in the US, our most important native pollinator that's out there, and 4,000 species of solitary bees, a whole tremendous diversity out there. And so I'm going to kind of hit these three major groups and tell you what we know and what we don't know about neonics and these different bees. So let's start off with honeybees. And I, um, it's a real challenge to think about, like, what's the best way to communicate um, something that people can kind of get their heads around in terms of um, a toxic dose or a toxic concentration. And so it's not, it's not perfect, but we tried to take all the data we could and convert it all into parts per billion, thinking of residues that these bees were coming in contact with. So if we just want to look at an acute lethal dose of neonics on honeybees, 180 parts per billion is all it takes in a little drop of nectar or a little drop of sugar water to kill a honeybee. 
If we want to look at chronic lethal toxicity, and this gets, this gets at what Pierre was talking about with um, low doses, let's say, in water over time, and like, oh yeah, that won't, you'll be perfectly safe at one part per billion, uh, but maybe not perfectly safe at one part per billion if you're swimming in it for 20 days. In this case, if we look at chronic lethal toxicity, pulling from the literature, multiple doses of about 40 parts per billion is enough to kill a bee. And then we get into the sublethal effects that we've talked, that you've already heard about. Impaired memory, impaired activity, impaired foraging, the inability, an impaired ability, so the inability to return to the hive, increased susceptibility to parasites and viruses. We see all of these effects at 10 to 40 parts per billion in nectar, in pollen, in the landscape. And this is just the honeybee. This is our Daphnia of bees, okay, to put that in context. This is our resistant, our resilient bee. Um, and so we're gonna, we'll come back to this. Um, I had a thought, ah, we'll just keep going. Um, I get these, I get all sorts of things that go through my head. Um, if we, now let's focus on bumblebees. Um, here in this case, acute lethal toxicity. One dose of 120 parts per billion um, is enough to kill a bee. Again, multiple doses of about 40 parts per billion, that's about the same. But the sublethal effects, oh, this was my thought. Sublethal effects are very interesting to me in that I think we have developed a risk management system that overall, as time goes on, has helped us manage away from acute problems. Like we don't, you, we've got accidents, we've got drift problems, we've got miscommunications between applicators and beekeepers where we have bee kills, but we've managed around that. What we have not managed around, what we are not capable of managing around yet, are sublethal effects. What happens when the bee kill doesn't take a, two minutes to happen or two days to happen, but it takes 20 days or it takes the rest of the growing season to see the effect? And that is a huge problem as we look at bee health, as we look at how to create resilient systems that are, as we look to try to manage around these problems. Because in this case, let's look at our sublethal effects. Impaired foraging again, reduced colony growth rate. Bumblebees, they start a colony every year. The queen comes out in the spring, she finds a nest, she lays her eggs, she builds that colony. By the middle of the summer, there are 100, maybe there are 100, 400 workers in that. And at the end of the year, new queens go out, new males go out, the queens mate, they hibernate for the winter, and the whole thing starts again the next year. Well, if you've got a slow colony growth rate, you're gonna reduce your reproductive output. You're gonna, in some studies, recent studies have demonstrated that at levels of seven parts per billion, seven parts per billion, that's not very much, 85% um, reductions um, in queen productivity, increased susceptibility of queens to a parasite at 1.5 and four parts per billion, and populations likely impacted by losses of queens. These are bees that very few people are tracking in ag landscapes, um, and these are levels that are incredibly low. Um, and if we go to our solitary bees, we know next to nothing. We know very little about lethal concentrations and pollen and nectar and what that might mean for them. So unknown for acute lethal, unknown for chronic lethal. There are some LD50 data out there here and there in terms of how much you can expose them to. But in terms of data on what they're, what they're actually encountering in the field in terms of pollen and nectar that they feed on, we have none of that. One study we do have demonstrates that the reproductive capacity of a solitary bee can be reduced by 50% at just 0.5 parts per billion to three parts per billion. I mean, this is next to nothing. This is like a wisp of a shadow of this product left around. Um, and in this case, these are solitary bees. If that female bee loses her ability to reproduce, if she stops production, that's it. This is, there's no colony, there's no workers that can be Oh, whatever, sort of cast away, and you're like, all right, we'll lose a few workers, that's not a big deal. No, in this case, this is the queen. This is the bee that does the reproduction. So if she stops producing, then at that point, she is unable, like that, her, their reproductive success just drops off immediately. So they respond quite differently from honeybees or bumblebees, and their populations, the populations of solitary bees, are much, much um, less resilient. So that's great, right? Okay, Mace, you gave me a bunch of data on parts per billion, I get it, it's low. Um, but isn't it really low? That's perfect. Um, and I think this is where it's important to look at, and this is, I've taken what we're, I usually do as maybe four or five slides and whoop, condense it down just into one. But looking at several studies conducted all across North America and Europe, 
um, I thought it'd be worth looking at, well, what are the residues that we do see in pollen, in nectar, and when might they be, when might they be meaningful? Like, when might these be levels that are actually worrisome? So if you look at canola that are seed treated, so the dose of a seed treatment is actually quite low. I mean, it's the, the brilliance of the seed treatment, right? Like, oh, we're putting so little on this plant. We're not spraying huge acres. Um, well, even with those low doses, relatively speaking, you're still seeing residue levels on the order of 3 to 10 parts per billion in pollen and 3 to 13 parts per billion in nectar. So obviously, based on what I said before, that's going to be affecting bumblebees. That's going to be affecting solitary bees. If we look at corn, seed treatments in corn, we're seeing residues of 12 parts per billion in pollen. And I took out my photos of bumblebees and honeybees collecting corn pollen. But rest assured, as a, it's a wind-pollinated plant. But if you're in Iowa and that's the only thing blooming and it's abundant, you're going to go collect from it and uh, quite a bit. So these are levels that are going to affect all of our bees. If we look at squash that are treated with the soil drench, where you're actually putting these systemic insecticides into the irrigation water around the squash, the residues can vary between 6 and 120 parts per billion um, in pollen and 5 and 18 parts per billion in nectar. Again, these are levels that are not going to kill those bees outright. They're not hitting that nectar and going, oh, I'm falling over, but they're taking it back to the nest and potentially over time encountering these sublethal effects. However, and these are, notice there are two of these are highlighted. Service berry bush, this is a, a common, uh, common shrub that blooms in the springtime. There's some studies looking at soil drenches there, not an agricultural weight. This is an ornamental application rate. And all of a sudden, the residues in the flowers, so this is whole flower residues, are 56 to 3,200 3, parts per billion. So that gets to be pretty high. If we look at squash that are just sprayed, where we spray these products on the leaves, in this case, um, the, the residue levels can be 36 to 147 parts per billion in pollen, 5 to 11 parts per billion in the nectar. Again, we're right in that sublethal level where we could be having these effects on all of our bees. And then we get to something like the little leaf linden. And we haven't, we know, we haven't talked, I mean, Michelle mentioned the Wilsonville bee kill. How many people here actually live in the Portland area? Okay, and then how many more of you, I'm assuming all of you are aware of the bee kill last year, um, and how many other people are just know what happened at our, at our target and the loss of the 50,000 bumblebees outside of town? Okay, maybe get me, you can see if you can, tomorrow if you come to the workshop, I'll tell you the story of breaking that and getting into that, how we discovered that and what happened there, because it was Xerxes, we had our team on the ground the day after it, it happened, and uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty crazy story. I'll show one picture here at the end. But you know, if you take a linden tree like we saw treated there, foliar sprays, just like we saw there, 3,000 to 7,000 parts per billion is what we found in those trees. And let me tell you, that resulted in bumblebees raining dead out of the trees. So that, there's an acute toxic dose that we can ideally manage for. So I think a reason I highlighted this too is that in agriculture, we're really managing around those very low doses. However, ornamental rates, ornamental application rates to plants and lawns are not regulated nearly so tightly. So the level of application um, can be up to 120 times greater. Like if you take an apple tree in Pennsylvania and compare it to a, an apple tree in your backyard, you can apply 120 times more neonic to that apple tree in your backyard. Perfectly legal, and I guarantee you, based on work that a colleague of mine at Penn State University has done, unfortunately, unfortunately that he hasn't published, that you're gonna create a tree that's gonna kill bees for three to five years, um, if not longer. So obviously, I mean, we've got to really work on avoiding the use, ornamental application rates, especially on any pollinator visited plants, and that'll come out more as we talk about, I think, policy um, issues in the future. Um, and then checking with your nursery to make sure the plants that you're purchasing haven't been treated. Because um, even if, you know, even if the nursery is doing their best, minimizing the dose, trying to be targeted, these products at even very low rates can have this impact, and those ornamental application rates are already uh, what's allowed is significantly higher. So it's really something to be tracking, to be paying attention to. Now, Pierre mentioned also other beneficial insects, and so I couldn't not talk about this a little bit. Um, we know that these sprays are lethal to parasitoid wasps and predators. These are the animals that attack your crop pests. We know that contaminated nectar reduces survivorship of lady beetles and lacewings. We know that the consumption of corn rootworm eggs sprayed with the metacloprid increases the, increases the mortality of minute pirate bugs. So these are, again, insects that attack your crop pest. And finally, we know that from studies that residues in soil are harmful to ground beetles and rove beetles. And you think, well, all right, that sounds 
that sounds bad, but what does that really mean? Well, it means potentially slugmageddon. So this is, this is a, co a, a term coined by a colleague at Penn State University, especially in soybean systems that are using reduced tillage um, and, and leaving a lot of residue on the ground. If those areas are treated with neonics, you lose the ground beetles and the rove beetles that attack and eat slugs and slug eggs. As a result, this is a harvester or at least some, some sort of farm equipment, actually, I wonder what that is, anyway, that is completely coated in slugs, like the fields are overrun with slugs. And so he actually, they've actually got some funding from EPA to do some research on trying to address this particular issue in soybean. So you lose your beneficial insects, and as we hear over and over and over again, you kill one thing, it reduces the, the beneficial insects that are around it, and you have outbreaks of something else, this unintended consequences. I think it's really important also to highlight, in fact, I had a very interesting conversation last week with CropLife and CropLife Canada, the um, lead lobbying firms for the pesticide industry, talking with them about this issue, about prophylactic use. So those sheet treatments are prophylactic. They're just applying to everything before we even, there's even a threat um, that's been addressed. So treatments to soybeans, so these prophylactic seed treatments to soybean don't consistently yield any sort of any benefit. They don't yield a benefit, I'm sorry, they don't result consistently in a benefit in yield. When pest activity is high, seed treatment of corn may increase yields, it might, but when pest pressure is reduced, there are no consistent differences in yield. If untreated corn, I'm sorry, untreated corn suffered more insect damage, all right, fair enough, but yields, the actual what's coming out of the field between seed treated and untreated corn did not differ. These are all you know, studies that are underway or completed across particularly the Midwest. And so really treating all or most seed is not warranted. I brought this to the, you know, the attention of CropLife and you know, their response back was, oh, but it's so much harder to come back if we go out and scout for, scout for, a, crop, for a pest and then we, oh, we miss it and then the pest comes out. I get that. I get that, that's hard. Um, and then like, oh, we have to come back with Laura's band, which is chlorpyrifos, is that? So we come back with these other products. You know what though, in a way, if we look at, if we step back and look at IPM, if we can reduce the use of these products across fields, I think I'm willing to take, I'm willing to take that. You know, a couple million acres with a little bit of Laura's band versus 200 million acres treated prophylactically. I just want there, I think we need to be moving towards IPM. I think we need to keep this I mean if we can't go all the way we could at least be moving towards using these combination of approaches to manage pests as an environmentally sensitive way as we can keeping like looking for thresholds of pest pressure scouting crops using disease and insect models to predict outbreaks starting with the least toxic control options and then going through a diversity of options there are a number of options that are out there even with these crops that are now whole treated with seed treatments across the board um, and I pulled this slide from a colleague of mine at the University of Sus Sus Sussex, David Goulson, um, and he just pulled it together from uh, research by um, a group, uh, uh, Bueno et al. And you know, looking at, cr at cropping systems, this was, I think, soybean, yeah, soybean. You know, if you've got farms that are practicing integrated pest management, biological control, neonic using neonics prophylactically, or just doing nothing, you know, integrated pest management again and again comes out as your top yielding system. Um, and so I think we really, you know, from my, with, from my perspective with the neonics, it comes down to can we get away from this blanket use all over the country without any thought. So to kind of sum up, I think sort of Pierre's points and mine, I mean, we've got, we're in this problem because they are less toxic to mammals um, and therefore considered reduced risk. I mean, we can't deny that. I, much rather get sprayed over by a neonic than I would by an organophosphate if, if that came up. That's a twisted thing to think about, but you get my point. Um, and at the moment, they are the most widely used insecticides in the world. However, because they are persistent over time, and I don't know if we've emphasized this enough, you know, it's one thing to have a situation where um, they, you spray something and it's gone in a few days, but to have these last day after day, if not year after year, and build up, tiny doses have an effect, Prophylactic use without IPM is the norm in many crops, and these ornamental rates are just too high. And they've led to situations like this, where here at this target, we bagged 57 linden trees last year in order to block the, to the bees from visiting those trees, um, and had probably over 100 people and 15 bucket trucks covering these trees in one day um, to protect them from insecticide use. It was crazy. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow if you want. Um, <laughs> So with that, I'll wrap up. We've got this nice summary of the research that I've got available that you can download from our website. 
and I've got a few hard copies. We've got a book on, a on native pollinator conservation that's available as well, and a resource center on our website. And I want to say thanks to Beyond Pesticides and NCAP for inviting me out today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Vaughan. And finally, we have Representative Redden. Here we are. Whoa. Good evening, and thank you uh, very much for having me here. I have some prepared remarks, and I'll get into those in a minute, but I know there's a lot of people here from out of state, and I want to explain just a little bit about how, uh, how, our, how we do things in Oregon. So we meet as legislators uh, about five months, one year, the odd years, and uh, one month on the even years. And it is very much a citizen legislator, legislature. Yeah, can't even say it. Um, so that's that's the way things get done here. And then uh, part of the time we're out campaigning, and and uh, silly people like me get involved in work groups and things like that. So that's that's kind of how we work. Um, and how many are from out of state? Oh wow. So anything I say, you'll forget, and uh, except for I found out I have one constituent in the room. So uh, <laughs> that's really dangerous. But So why do we get so passionate about pollinators? My reasons are very simple. I think back uh, to my friends Bill and Wendy who are in North Dakota and they, uh, they raise bees and they harvest honey. And then they take those bees to Texas in the winter and, and pollinate crops down there. Um, I think of my friend Ann, it's just a backyard uh, beekeeper. And uh, they lost a lot of bees last year, most of them. They don't know why. I really think the most about my granddad. Great guy and raised bees and sitting at that farm table and just, you know, scraping that honey out of the comb and, you know, how good that is. I mean, that is, that is living. Um, and lately I've been thinking about those 28 blueberries that I just planted out in front of my house this year because my wife and I are converting our front yard to, uh, to garden. Plan on uh, living there for a long time and, and uh, pretty happy about that. It's mainly her idea, I'll admit it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> when I saw the news last year about the massive bee kill in Wilsonville and uh, started to learn at that time a little bit about neonicotinoids, couldn't even pronounce it at the time, uh, I was, it, it really hit me hard. Just, uh, you know, with the background, the limited background that I have. Uh, then I learned that there were three additional kills using the same chemicals. And these were done, all of them were done by licensed, trained, ODA approved uh, applicators. And three of the four, three of the four followed label directions. And I'm thinking, this is, this is crazy. Um, so I, I waited, uh, kept following the news, and I kept thinking, well, somebody's got to jump up and do something about this. And I kept waiting, and I finally called the uh, Department of Agriculture and got a kind of a report from them, and they were doing their research, and, and, and they, they are a, a good, good group. Uh, very diligent. They did place a, a ban on the neonics for, uh, until last uh, December 24th. And uh, they've also worked with Oregon State University, which has a couple of uh, folks that are uh, working on the bees constantly and uh, have world, worldwide experts. So they were working on that. Uh, they did immediately decide to em enhance the program, the, the training program, to include more information about pollinators and included that in the testing. So they kind of did, did some, you know, what they could. Um, so I give them some credit. But here's what struck me as really odd. We have this one group over here that's educated and they're trained and they're using neonics and killing bees by the tens of thousands. Then we have this other group that's the home gardeners like myself. And I later found out the nurserymen who have thousands of acres of nursery stock. They're using this stuff. and. What do they rely on for information? That label, that label that's on there. And I, so I went to the store, I checked on the Bayer label on some uh, systemic row stuff the other day. 
and it's small, micro print, black. And I was looking for it. I, I really had a struggle to find it. Small, tiniest black print you could make on a dark green background. That's what, you know, and, and these are people, it's designed for people like me, you know, it's spring, it's good weather. I want to go out there and get busy and, you know, kill whatever. That's the old Jeff, that's the old Jeff, really it is, okay? But I mean, seriously, isn't that the way a lot of people think? And uh, you get excited, it's, it's a fun thing. So, um, that's, you know, it, it just struck me. It just, it, I'm, not, I'm not the scientist. You're gonna figure that out pretty quickly. Um, but it just struck me, this is totally wrong, but what do, I, what do I do about it? So as a legislator, all I can do, really, is uh, convene people. So I started you know, trying to get the smartest people I could that knew something about uh, uh, the use of the chemicals and when they might, or people that believe they might have a good use, and uh, uh, people that may have a, a differing view. Um, so I did start out with the idea. I thought maybe the ODA was right on the ball there, would just ban this stuff. It's obviously poisonous. It's killing bees uh, by great amounts. And, um, you know, so what if people, maybe if people really want to use it that badly, they can just uh, study up and they can get the license or they can hire a, uh, an applicator. Um, but uh, early in the process, I learned, uh, I, I did reach out to both supporters and the non-supporters, I mentioned that. But it didn't take very long for me to realize there's a political reality in, in, uh, in play here. Uh, my own leadership of my own party, people that support me and love me, uh, advise me that this ban idea, this is not going to fly. Okay? And, um, you know, as a matter of fact, I, I think it was, I was actually told something like, there's no way in hell that bill's going to pass. Or are you nuts? And, and uh, I think that was actually repeated a couple of times. So I did uh, form a stakeholder group to discuss the issues. And uh, so we got the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Uh, the Oregon's, Oregonians for Food and Shelter and uh, the Farm Bureau, both advocates of uh, pesticide use, Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Beyond Toxics, um, and Xerces Society was represented. We had several meetings. Uh, I actually feel like just getting people together to talk about, well, what, what would be a reasonable bill? What, that was actually a success, getting these folks to talk to each other, but that just didn't happen. Uh, so I feel very good about that. Uh, so we did form, um, uh, develop a bill, and um, I did have a couple of misconceptions going into the process, I have to tell you. The first was that, that the federal government would be the ones that would make things happen. I mean, they have, they have all the resources, right? Uh, not, not, not so much. Uh, I learned that, uh, it's really true what Justice Brandis said back in 1932, that states are the laboratories of democracy. We're a little more agile. We can make some changes here. Um, my other misconception was that work groups were kind of lame. Uh, kind of a political tool used to make it look like uh, something was being worked on. And I suppose that could happen <laughs> some places. Um, but you know, really, through my participation, in uh, other work groups last year, uh, I really value those. I worked on uh, water resources issues, uh, worked on a solar work group issue, and I also witnessed other work groups. And that's the way things happen in Oregon. It's, uh, it, it, you have to get people together. I mentioned being a convener. That's really important. And for, for people like myself that are not trained scientists, uh, that's the best I can do is try to bring those folks together um, so I think it will, it, it'll happen, we can get some stuff done, but uh, uh, the other problem is it takes time. And sometimes contentious bills um, might take a session or two or three to get anything done. But we don't have several sessions. We need to take action on neonicotinoids now. I'm an optimist, and I think Oregon can help lead the way in how we think and talk about pesticides and the way they're used. Oregon has been a leader in environmental issues for decades. Other states have looked at our bottle bill, our 
what we've done with the beaches for public access and our land use. And they look at us with envy. We've done some great things in this state. Um, I encourage all of you to contact uh, and keep pushing on this issue. We've got to keep this dialogue going, working. Uh, make sure that your leaders in your states are very aware of this issue and uh, what we need to do. Um, I also look, I, I selfishly, you know, I talked a little bit about Oregon and some of our successes. I selfishly would like to see Oregon change that dynamic and really make sure that you know, when people in the future, if they, if they have to use a chemical, they're educated about it. They know the risks that are involved. They don't look to, to the, what's on the shelf, what can I use? They don't look there first. They know that there's risk. So we've got a, a big job to do on education. We need that, we need other things that the Xerces Society is coming up with and their ideas and other ideas as well. Um, so anyway, I look forward to seeing innovative solutions from all the states, not just Oregon. Um, you know, those juicy apples, uh, the fresh pears, the delicious tomatoes and other foods that we eat. Some people say about 35% of what we eat all require pollinators. Yet the bee populations are declining, and they've drastically declined since 1960s when Rachel Carson came out with Silent Spring. It's not getting any better. So I think it's time for all of us, everyone in this room, to recommit to the political battle, because it is a political battle. We know what the science is. You know better than I. But it's going to be a political battle. We have to recommit to that, and I think we have to do it to protect our way of life indeed to protect our very existence. Thank you for having me here this evening. Thank you, um, Representative Redden. We will now open the floor to questions. Uh, but where's my mic guy, Matt? This lady right here. Hi, I'm pretty inexperienced in this whole um, area of changing um, the laws and the uses of chemicals like this. And what I'm wondering is, I'm totally committed to outlawing these classes of chemicals, but how do you, what do you see the path of that being? I mean, we could try to get a citizen, you know, uprising to say outlaw it, but then how do you change industrial agricultural use of these chemicals? I mean, what do you see the path as being? That's an easy one. You take that one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This, oh, this is on. Excellent. Um, I mean, there's. I think there are two ways. In my mind, in the in the U.S. in particular, I think. I think the way that we're looking at it is. Um, I try to where we work in a. We try to collaborate pretty closely with agriculture. Like I see long-term solutions coming out coming from. Diverse, co the diverse coalitions of conservationists, people who are concerned about a problem, pushing on that, creating a demand, creating a, a consumer demand, and then you know, help, hoping that land-grant universities, that researchers, we can come up with, let's say, integrated pest management plans that lead us to some long-term solution. However, from my perspective, to get to that point where there's enough pressure on, let's say, industry to step back and say, okay, Right now, it's easy for us to, to seed tree crops, let's say, and just put that in the ground. That's easy, it's straightforward, we make some money from it, everyone's happy, except for all of us, I suppose. Uh, to create a situation where consumers are demanding some sort of a change has a dramatic impact. Um, and we're seeing that now with marketing. We're seeing that with major food companies that are asking their suppliers, okay, you know, we're hearing it, we're under, our consumers, the people who buy our products want us to do something differently. Um, if you've got something like the ban, the two-year temporary ban on the, the, I guess it's just the three major, is it all four of the major neonics? I think it's just the top three. Top three. Okay, on um, bee pollinated crops. That puts everybody on notice. So big agriculture at that point is saying, okay, all right, I need to, this is something I need to pay attention to, which gets them. You're taking them to court. Well. The agriculture is taking the European the, Union to court. Absolutely, so the, so the European, so the big ag is taking the European Union to court. However, 
in the United States, it's got them saying, okay, well, we need to now, the, the optimistic way to look at it is do something because there's a demand for a change. The pessimistic way to look at it would be we need to cover our butts. Um, either way, there's, there's, people are starting to come to the table. I'm not convinced it leads to the, it'll lead to the happiest solution or the best solution. In fact, in all likelihood, we'll see resistance development and a new product come out and that's how we'll get out of this. Um, oh, I hate it that Pierre is shaking his head yes at that. Um, but I do think that there are steps that can take, you know, by having consumers, by having people demand a change, that, that does lead to benefits. And that's, at the very least, that's what we need to be doing and pushing on. And then, in my work, I really try to work with that ad community to say, okay, look, how can I help incentivize that further? You know, they, we can, I can work with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and if there is a new integrated pest management plan that can help protect bees, it is totally possible that I can, I can set up a program, or I can not, me personally, but I could help orchestrate a program with colleagues within this agency to incentivize adoption of that. Now, granted, it's going to be probably, you know, just nipping around the edges of it, but still, it's a step in the right direction. It's progress. And so, to the, to the best of our ability, with the skills that we can bring to the table, we'll be working sort of at all these different angles. Because, I mean, ultimately, we need to eat. This is our big food production system, so I want to try to help support ch beneficial changes wherever we can. Wow. Okay. What are So, so yeah, I totally agree that the demand has to come from from the base, from from the consumers, from you. Um, at the end of the day, it, there's also you know politics are important here, and how different governments will fall on the which side of the precautionary principle they fall on. Yeah. Uh, what happened in Europe? I mean, you know, I, I would be lying if I said I mean it made it sound very pat, but obviously not all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. And I mean, it's, it's the same, same with tobacco, right? I mean, people say, well, my granddaddy smoked all his life and he doesn't have lung cancer, right? So, I mean, w you can point to exceptions. It's messy. The data oftentimes are messy. There are many different uh, you know, species of bees, species of pollinators. The conditions are different from test to test to test to test. And yeah, there's variation. You can point, and industry does regularly point to tests where they say, well, we've gone and we've put hives in the middle of a canola field, nothing happened. So it's proof that these compounds don't have an impact. Well, it's proof that you didn't have the impact you were looking for in that particular field under those specific conditions, yes. But you see, so, so there's a lot of that. And anyway, making a long story short, so in the EU, there was, the precautionary principle was invoked by the European Commission to go forward and, and institute this ban. Uh, now they're being sued in the European uh, Court of Justice. Uh, so it'll be interesting. It'll be very interesting to see what happens in the Netherlands yeah. with the total ban, uh, if, that, if that goes through. Uh, because again, that was a political decision. This was all the parties getting together, the Greens and everybody else basically, I think it, what, don't think it was unanimous, but I think it was, it, it was definitely a, majority who voted this in. So um, whether we'll ever see that here, I'm not sure. But that's, so I think you need both. You need, you need to have the people put pressure on the governments and governments do what they, they think the, the people want. I mean, there's lots of examples with the OPs where that, and birds where, where that happened. Uh, and where people want change and push hard for it, you know, sometimes it'll happen. to say I agree with most of what you said, but I also am disapp I'm disappointed that the university professors like you have not been taking the steps necessary to inform the rest of the population of the condition. Why so much silence in the land-grant universities in this country and elsewhere, yeah. agricultural universities? Why do they allow all this money of the industry to come and contaminate your science? So you by yourself, you saw all this evidence that you do too, and then nothing happens. She's asking a very legitimate question. Why the university ought to be at the forefront of informing and convincing the politicians that this is unacceptable? Can you please uh, respond to that? Well, <laughs> there is a, um, 
If you haven't read it, um, there's a very good book. It was written quite a long time ago by uh, Van den Bosch. Uh, I forget oh, I his. Read it. Yeah, yeah, I the Best Side Conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he explains. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Right, and he explains in there exactly, and he, he was really mad, right, you can tell. And he was not raging green. This was an entomologist who used pesticides in his job, but he was an IPM guy who believed that, you know, IPM comes first and pesticides come second. And it's a bit of an indictment, and he's got one chapter on the universities, and he's got one chapter on the media, and he's got another chapter on this, and basically, uh, documents the pervasive influence of, uh, of, of the, the pesticide manufacturing industry on those various bodies. And I'd say he probably has the, one of the better, the best analyses that I've seen. And we, well, well, what is depressing is I, I sort of, you know, you, you, you read that and I look at it from time to time and you say, well, yeah, has anything changed? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's. You spoke out, you don't speak out, not me, you. But the vast majority of the American scientists, the Canadian scientists, <coughs> the European scientists stay behind their ivory door. They don't. They well, that's, yeah, that's that's a really complex. That's a very complex answer. I mean, a lot of them get funding from those those same uh, companies. The companies support the universities, uh, and there's a long history of uh, professors who have been pilloried and hounded out of their academic posts because they've, they spoke out. Yeah. Mace, uh -oh. the one slide you had with the crop consultant um, not wanting to have to come back and look again, so they're going to go ahead and spray the first time. Who employs that crop consultant? Is it industry or private? That varies. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of the, the different farmers that I've worked with. Um, more often than not, they are going to be representatives of those companies. And so, one of the um, one of the strategies that you know we've looked into, and that others have spent more time on, are you know at least getting say best management practices to those communities, and that is taking off. But best management practices is, can be pretty generic. Um, and being able to translate, let's say, the development of a really carefully thought out, updated, integrated pest management plan for dealing with wireworm and uh, rootworm in corn in Iowa, you know, that's, that takes time. That takes careful crop scouting. That takes investment. Um, and you know, I feel like it's it's an important avenue we have to try to walk down. But I absolutely worry about um, who's who's paying for what, um, and I think that's a real challenge. The lady in the black in front. Okay. When you were describing um, that the termites stopped grooming and had increased fungus, you actually reminded me of my son. Um, because he had um, increased fungus and therefore um, autism symptoms. And he had high levels of glyphosate, 8.7 parts per billion in his urine. And when that was um, eliminated through eating organic, he, um, his autism symptoms also went away. Hmm. So GMOs are a pesticide delivery system. We all know that they're genetic, genetically engineered to withstand pesticides. So when GMOs are labeled, they will, that will decrease the demand for um, GMOs, right? People will not buy them as much and therefore decrease the um, demand for pesticides being used. And so I'm wondering why if the number one issue here that we're talking about today in pesticides is harm to the environment and harm to the health of living things, why isn't the GMO labeling campaigns, why aren't they making health the number one issue? And do you think they should be? That sounds like a question. <laughs> well, I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Save but right on. <laughs> I can answer that. I am a holistic nurse practitioner. I've got my master's in nursing, and I work 20, 20 plus years in the health field. The chemical companies are the drug companies. That's your answer. Why aren't the campaigns labeling 
campaigns taking on health as a number one issue rather than the right to vote? That's a good question. Ask the people that are putting together the campaigns because I am, her question is why aren't they focusing the campaigns that are out there, why aren't they focusing on health? And that's actually one of the reasons I'm here because my, I've, I've called myself a holistic nurse practitioner for two years. I am trying, I have connected the dots. It's amazing to me how few in my field have and how, n how nobody in the public has. Children are dying. I know. Dying. I know. And, and we'll talk later. Yeah, and I do think, I mean, that's a critically important issue. And I think this panel and the expertise that are up here have been focused on this one issue. That doesn't mean these other issues aren't important. And that in this community right here, I mean, this is a community of people that are working on the, that very issue you're talking about. It just doesn't happen to be the expertise right, that we brought together. It correlates. So. What's happening with the insects correlates exactly. Totally. When you look at the layering, I mean, if you want to, I mean, I could go on about glyphosate and what that, you know, GMO crops mean for a loss of milkweed and all these plants that are important for pollinators. Um, and that that's likely part of the of the of the you know the threats and the causes of declines in bees and monarch butterflies all these things you're absolutely right um, but you know I think we each sort of bring our expertise to the table so I think it's a, a very good question but and and this GMO question um, could be posed again at our GMO workshop tomorrow yeah and I'm, I'm talking about it first thing in the morning if anybody wants to have coffee with me so. <laughs> we'll be here. I'll be there. 8.45, I think. Um, my name is Mark Emmerich. I'm president of the Washington State Beekeepers Association. Um, I've actually had interactions with all three of you gentlemen, although we've never met. I apologize for that. No, that's okay. Um, I do want to quickly make an apology to Representative Reardon. You were on the end of a scathing email when the bill failed to ban pesticides in Oregon because I've been trying for three years in Washington State to do it and haven't had any success. It's working. And I was hoping that since you had the big bee kill, it was going to be a two inch putt for you. <laughs> and uh, so from that standpoint, um, I know how hard it is to get legislation pushed through. And I know how hard it is, whether you're Democrat or Republican or liberal or conservative, that uh, you have a lot of hurdles to jump to get decent legislation, uh, legislation through from one side to the other. So I hope you'll accept my apology. <laughs> no apology uh, necessary at all. It's, it is a challenge, um, but uh, it's one that I take on very gladly. Hi, my name is Brad. I um, have a question about the number or the percentage of bees that are collapsing per annum. You're talking about uh, the hive collapse of about, <clears throat> excuse me, of about 33%. <clears throat> question is over time, if that continues at that rate, when will we see a point where we're not able to supply enough food? We'll see an escalation in prices, and uh, who knows what else may happen. I think that's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, talking with beekeepers, it's considered that anything more than about 20%, 20, 20 to 22% is, is not sustainable in the long term. And we're seeing beekeepers now um, going out of business. So Jim Doan is one person who just comes immediately to the mind. He would have been one of the large, what have, actually I think he was the largest beekeeper in New York State. And he called it quits last year. Um, so we are starting to see beekeepers going out of business because of these losses. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that. We're also seeing overall honey production dropping. We're seeing hives that are coming out of these different crops getting weaker and weaker. Um, we won't ever get to the point where we'll starve. I mean, we've got that going for us. We eat a lot of corn, soybeans, self-pollinates, wheat, rye, oats, etc. There's a lot of gruel out there. Um, <laughs> and there's a, a lot of our, I mean, many of our plants do, you know, there is some self-pollination. Um, 
and whatnot. But the Chinese are doing it by hand. Chinese, yeah, 40, what is it? Oh, I used to have it in my head. I gave this talk so many times. But 40%, most of the apples in the world are grown in China, and 40% of Chinese apples are now hand pollinated. If you go to Hawaii, um, I thought that was just one of those sort of like, okay, worst case scenario stories that you could sort of share at a talk to kind of get people's attention. But Hawaii right now, people, um, beekeepers are having a very hard time in Hawaii and pumpkin squash growers in Hawaii, in Hawaii are now hand pollinating, many of them, I don't know the percentages, but many of them are hand pollinating their fields. Um, so you know, if, if we're desperate enough, um, we'll go out there and hand pollinate. That works all right. <laughs> Lady. Hi. Um. I'm Dee Dee McKeel. I'm from Bremerton, Washington. Um, I recently started a journey that led me here um, because uh, recently they approved a contract in my city um, to spray glyphosate along the sidewalks and um, streets, about 30 miles, and it's in the Puget Sound. It's surrounded, you know, where our stormwater drains right into uh, the Puget Sound area. And um, I, I initially thought that this contract would be disapproved because so many of the council people who approved it um, had run on a, a campaign of sustainability. And um, I, was, I was astounded. I was like, why, why, would, you do, why would you vote for that? <laughs> um, but it passed, six to one. And so I, I thought, well, you know, I know that's wrong. I live near a stormwater drain. And, um, I've been taught through my employer and whatnot that if you see something draining down those stormwater drains, make sure it's water. <laughs> and if it's not, you report it. So, um, so I started this journey. I, um, I, I started by letting my council know that I totally object to glyphosate being used on my streets and sidewalks. It's just not right. Um, there's too much information. I, I just recently read a study. Came, came out. It's a comparative study out of MIT. Um, came out last fall about the um, increase of glyphosate tracked exactly across the increase of modern diseases in the United States, not in the other countries, just here, because it's so pervasive in our our society. So uh, I um, I pushed. And I went then, I, I looked, is there a gold standard for my community to say, you know, this isn't right? Um, where does this fall in environmental impact? And I went to the Puget Sound Partnership, which is an organization in the Puget Sound area that is to restore the waters of the Puget Sound for, for agri you know, for, uh, to return it to where it used to be. And so, um, uh, one of uh, my community members recommended I come here and uh, learn a little more about it. Uh, pushing my city, pushing this issue, they are developing a green policy uh, now uh, for land management, park management. But really, um, you want to lean on, on our educators. The, the people you need to lean on is all of you and me to advocate to your representatives or to participate in that government and set policy to um, remove these things from your communities. That's where it starts. Um, we're all responsible. We all can participate. We can become the they that say, no, this isn't acceptable to me in my community, and um, I, I'm going to just say no. So I um, uh, also wanted to ask the question, my question, <laughs> is the substitute is now a mazepir. And I have no idea what that compares to glyphosate. Um, uh, I, I realize that it's worse. It's, it's worse. Well, that's what I thought after I read the, I read the MSDS. And I wanted to just kind of know, where does that fall? Is it a neonic? Is, what is it? Jim, I can, I can start with that. Um, Mazapir is it's an herbicide like glyphosate, so it's a it's a pesticide that attacks the plants, um, and it's sort of similarly, if I remember correctly, it's similarly sort of broad spectrum, um, and in my it's in my understanding the, the the thing about glyphosate is it breaks down its the residues are there, but its activity breaks down relatively quickly, um, yeah, but well. 
compared to a maz compared to a mazapir, it does, um, which lasts for several many months. It's active. It's active for many many months, um, and so it's something that I would. I don't see that. I don't understand why they would. I don't understand the the whole thing makes no sense to me, um, and I would not. Neither one of those makes sense to me. So I don't even. Why even? Yeah, I don't get it. That's bizarre. That's what that's what mowing is for and pulling weeds and. My, my name is Alex Hudson, and I'm here from, I'm here from Olympia. Uh, I'm a new, a new beekeeper in the last few years. And uh, I was curious, you showed some information. You showed some information about the um, expense of these chemicals. The glyphosate is up in the billion a year industry. And you also indicated that it doesn't increase the crop yield. Uh, my real question was, how could organic food cost more? Yeah, well, could you clear, I'm, I guess, so I'm, I'm just trying to get the question clarified. Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, it, this is. If it's not being sprayed with glyphosate to ripen the sugar cane, and it's not being sprayed with the so part, and it's not being sprayed with any neonicotinoids, sure. or if the seeds are untreated, okay. how could it potentially cost less to add chemicals? Yeah, I mean, that's sort of, I think somebody said subsidies. I think you lose, you know, there's, God, that's a huge question. It's, it's a big question. My, I'm, I'll let. Economies of scale? Yeah. 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 I mean, economies of scale, distribution, it's a whole different model for, uh, for raising food. Is there a and, and at the top that can sell this to people when it doesn't work? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it is? It, it, I mean, it doesn't work. Going, it kills, we're here because it kills beef. It, it, it causes birth defects and cancer or both. And we're upset because it's killing bugs. No, it's... It, in people, I'm talking about okay. in people, the birth defects. And they, do work, they do kill insects. As I mentioned several times, they are very, very good insecticides. And, you know, and, and if a termite was, was sort of munching away through my house, I'd probably say, hmm, <laughs> you know, that probably is a better product than chlorpyrifos in terms of the residues. So, so, so they do work. Now, the question is, do they work all the time? Are they needed all the time on the, you know, 200 million acres of corn and soybean? The answer is no, apparently, according to the research. But it's not that they're not, you know, effective insecticides. They're, they're actually very, very good at killing insects. If killing bugs doesn't increase your yield, then what's the point of spending money to kill the bugs? Um, yeah. yeah that's, <laughs> that's the point. That's the point we're, we're that's the question we're asking, yeah. essentially, and that, that some people are starting to ask. Exactly. I actually have a technical question. Um, we've talked a little bit about the breakdown of the pesticides that are being used. What are the adverse effects, if any, of the byproducts, the breakdowns in the pesticides? And is anybody looking at that? Yeah, it's extremely, extremely complex with neonicotinoids. Each product has at least a half dozen, if not more, metabolites that are produced as, as breakdown products. Some of them, um, some of them have higher. The, the one, the one major concern that I know of is imidacloprid. Uh, one of the uh, metabolites actually is quite a bit more toxic to m mammals than the parent product. So saying, you know, the product is is has got lower toxicity is fine. But if if there's a substantial proportion of it which does break down either in soils and the environment or in vivo, when somebody ingests it, then it kind of defeats the purpose. So, but it's very complicated. With, with bees, for instance, there's at least with imidacloprid, there's at least two of the other metabolites, the olefin, the 5-hydroxy metabolite, that are just as toxic to bees as the parent compound. So even if you know you say, well, half-life of 100 days, uh, and then it goes on. This is not to mineralization. This is to, this is to oftentimes to other breakdown products. 
and uh, some of them are just as toxic. So it's a, it's a very complex, complex uh, issue with these compounds. And I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I, uh, I have a, not really a question as much as a comment. I brought Don Huber and Bob Streit to Hawaii to educate about glyphosate. And as I walked through the field of a coffee plantation that had been had uh, a lot of glyphosate sprayed on it, I learned that in any non-organic crop to lower labor costs as you walk through two lines of crops so that a laborer can pick items and also a, uh, a mach uh, machine can go through, that herbicides are dumped <laughs> on the ground. So whether it's grapes and, you know, here, have a glass of wine with some Roundup in it. Have some coffee with some Roundup. Have a banana with some Roundup. You know, that this is a profound um, concern to me. And uh, the other thing is that I've been involved with uh, trying to support scientists who are having their uh, income taken away with uh, independent research on some of the things going on in the, the, uh, the attacks and taking away of uh, professional lives is so real. I made a substantial grant for the exploration of this organism that Don Huber talks about, this organic biomatrix that uh, is involved in possible sudden infant death syndrome and, and uh, chronic botulism in the intestines. I had to make the grant not even knowing the name of the scientist at, at the University of South Florida, okay? And, and because they were so afraid that the whole department would lose its funding. And then another thing is I want you to know that as Andres Carrasco, who studied glyphosate in embryos, where they found that there was an encephaly, a lack of a cortex development or whatever brain development that they have in tadpoles, um, you know, that a group of people stoned the car with the uh, scientists in it that were going to go present at the conference in Argentina. And then if you learn that in Yakima, in the Yakima area, up in Washington State, I've never been there, you have an eight-fold increase of encephaly in humans, okay? And when you look at, they can't figure out what happened. It's heavy Roundup use. They can't figure out what caused it. Did they eat nitrates in their meat? Or um, did they not take enough folic acid? And, and the suppression of information really bothers me. With chronic botulism, if you look at the CDC reports with chronic botulism in, uh, in infants and sudden infant death syndrome, for some reason that seems to appear in rural counties. And the only human studies on Roundup and glyphosate are primarily done outside of the United States. So we live like um, in a highly information reduced society here in America. We are not the freedom of information society that maybe I grew up with, thinking, you know, like that I was really proud of my country. So I'm sorry to get so emotional, but I really feel strongly. Well, at this point, I would like to um, wrap up. Um, thank our panel. Um, for being here and presenting your work with us tonight.